Good morning, everybody. Holger told me to start on time, so that's what we'll do. Um, today is not uh, normal grand rounds. Today is cast and day, and that's a very special day for pediatric cardiology, and uh, all of you who want to join us for the other things that are going on today. My name is Lars Grossworthman. I'm the division head of Pete's Cardiology, and I'm filling in for Mark Reller, who uh, really deserves all the credit along with uh, Liz Schultz and Monique Bohan for uh, organizing this cast and day. It's wishing to honor the memory of their grandson who died in Louis Louisville, Kentucky, from complications of congenital heart disease. That time, less than 50% of all children with congenital heart disease made it to adulthood. The boy's grandparents lived in Portland and donated the funds to the Division of Pediatric Cardiology at OHSU. Family's wish was to bring experts to our program in order to further the understanding and improve the outcomes of children with congenital heart disease. A couple who established the account were older and last visited our program in 1984. The Kazan event is a special day for the OHSU Pediatric Cardiology Program and now the Heart Center at large. We free up the members of our division, so physicians, APPs, nurses, fellows, technologists, and uh, for a day of learning and exchange together with the visiting scholar. Just going to share the lineup of speakers that have joined us for cast and day in the past. Hopefully you can see this. And it really uh, reads like a who is who of pediatric cardiology, congenital heart disease, surgery, forward this and cardiac intensive care now those of you who pay close attention spotted dr newberger on this list she was our cast and visiting scholar in 1999 and that feels like a long time ago that's because it was spongebob first hit our televisions yugoslavia was still a country and Europe gave itself the euro currency in that year. The fact that she's back after 22 years is a testament to her tremendous achievements and enduring impact that Dr. Neuberger continues to have on our field. With that, I'm handing the baton over to Monique Bohan, who will introduce Dr. Neuberger. Monique is the center of our COVID efforts in cardiology, as well as an expert in Kawasaki disease. Monique. Hi, thank you very much. Um, hang on just one moment now. I'm uh, just rearranging and it is my honor and is certainly a pleasure to introduce our speaker for Grand Rounds today. Dr. Jane Neuberger is the Commonwealth Professor of Pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School and the Associate Chief for Academic Affairs at the Department of Cardiology at Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Neuberger is well known to many of us for her research in Kawasaki disease. She began caring for patients with KD in the early 1980s, shortly after completing her fellowship training in cardiology at Boston Children's Hospital and her master's degree in public health. She established a team to care for children with this disease at Boston Children's Hospital, and she would go on to test IVIG in the U.S. with the multicenter trial that led to our current standard therapy for children with KD. She's been instrumental in much of the research surrounding Kawasaki disease, including using Z-scores to diagnose coronary artery enlargement and authoring the 2004 AHA guidelines for Kawasaki disease that launched an algorithm to assess for incomplete Kawasaki disease, all with the goal of avoiding coronary artery aneurysms in children. Certainly, it is somewhat overwhelming to look through Dr. Neuberger's long list of publications that include not just seminal works in the study of KD, but also extensive research into the neurodevelopment of children with congenital heart disease, academic work that spanned several decades. In April of 2020, the pediatric community started to recognize a new clinical entity in children that became known as Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome in Children, or MIS-C. Dr. Neuberger has been significantly involved in establishing our current understanding of MIS-C, having some of the first publications in the New England Journal of Medicine in circulation in the summer of 2020. She also contributed to the growing lit literature surrounding myocarditis temporally as associated with uh, the COVID vaccination in children. Dr. Neuberger is the national primary investigator of the multicenter music study looking at the long-term outcomes of MIS-C uh, that is supported by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the National Institutes for Health, and she's the cardiology lead for the CDC's Overcoming COVID-19 study. 
She also leads multi-center studies on long-term medical and neurodevelopmental outcomes in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, the impact of technical performance of cardiac surgeons, and the relationship of genetic factors to outcomes in, children's with heart, in children with heart disease. She has received multiple awards, including the Distinguished Scientist Award of the American College of Cardiology and the Clinical Research Prize of the American Heart Association. And she continues to be clinically active, caring for children with congenital and acquired cardiovascular disease. Dr. Neuberger is presenting pediatric ground rounds today on the topic of COVID-19 and cardiovascular complications in children. Please welcome Dr. Jane Neuberger. Thank you, Monique. That was just really, really nice. <laughs> um it's it's wonderful to uh to be given grand rounds remotely uh i uh, said said uh not to be there in person but great to see you so many old friends on the screen um these are my uh disclosures but none actually uh create a conflict uh that that would impact the content of this talk uh, Today, we're going to talk a little about cardiac manifestations and other manifestations of MIS-C, the best treatments, and then I'll spend some time uh, at the end talking about vaccine myocarditis. Well, I think uh, this is a WHO world map that I downloaded over the weekend. Uh, it's now ancient history that, uh, that COVID-19 began in December 2019 in Wuhan City. If we uh, look at the number of cases today in the world, uh, there are 259 million cases, 5.2 million deaths, and 8 billion vaccine doses that have been administered. Um, I also downloaded this map over the weekend. So November 26 shows what's happening in the US today. It's a seven day case rate per 100,000 with the hotspots being in Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, New Mexico, and then in my neck of the woods uh, in New Hampshire and Maine. And of course, the hotspots uh, keep moving around. Now, fortunately, um, although there are 6.8 million uh, cases in children, it's usually much milder in kids than adults. Uh, since the pandemic started, 17% of confirmed cases uh, have been in children, but if you look just in the last week, it's 25%. And uh, with almost 9,000 cases per 100,000 children in the population, uh, that means almost 10% have been affected. Uh, and uh, depending on uh, the state that you live in, between 0.1% to 1.9% of children are hospitalized. The mortality rate in children, again, from state-based data, ranges from 0, point, uh, from 0 percent uh, to less than 0 0.23 percent. Um, fortunately, though, it seems like the risk is mostly confined to children with medical complexity and certain underlying conditions like type 1 diabetes, uh, cardiac and circulatory uh, abnormalities, and uh, obesity. This is an article from JAMA Open uh, that uh, did a regression analysis. Uh, and you can see uh, in uh, the A panel that hospitalization with children with no chronic disease being your reference, that you were much more likely to be hospitalized if you had non-complex chronic disease, and even more so with complex chronic disease. And uh, if you were hospitalized, severe illness was also much more common uh, with non-complex chronic disease or complex chronic disease. But our comfort that children were relatively spared from acute COVID was shattered uh, in mid-April of 2020. And at that time, we learned of very sick children with features of Kawasaki disease, shock and cytokine storm from our colleagues, uh, first in Bergamo, Italy, then London, and then the boroughs of New York. And uh, also at that time, there was, was really a worldwide alert that went out from health agencies uh, across the globe, including the CDC, uh, which called the syndrome the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. This graph uh, was one of the first to point out the surge, that the surge uh, of Miss c occurs about a month after um, COVID peaks in any region. So this is in London, 
uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, and then this C, and we saw a very similar pattern uh, in New York City uh, in uh, the New England Journal article in June, where blue cases are COVID and red is Miss C, and in the overcoming COVID study, again, yellow are SARS-CoV-2 positive tests, red bars are cases of Miss C, and that's consistent with a post-infectious kind of inflammatory etiology. The case definition uh, for Miss C to be uh, age less than 21 years, although we know that there is also Miss A in young adults, fever for at least 38 degrees for at least 24 hours, uh, lab evidence of inflammation, which is usually profound, um, evidence of clinically severe illness that requires hospitalization, so that is still a necessary feature uh, for the CDC definition, as well as at least two organ involvement. Um, one has to be positive for current or recent SARS-CoV-2 infection, either by PCR, by serology or antigen, or by COVID-19 exposure with, to somebody close within a month of the onset of symptoms, and then no plausible alternative explanations. Now, importantly, uh, some individuals seem to fulfill complete and part or partial criteria for Kawasaki disease. They are still included uh, in the diagnosis of Miss C if they meet the case definition. Uh, and I can tell you it is really hard, uh, having done Kawasaki's for years, very hard to tell some children apart. So um, I think everybody in this audience is familiar with the conjunctival injection, strawberry tongue, rash, swollen hands and feet, uh, and um, we don't usually see a unilateral node as much uh, in Miss C. 5% of Kawasaki patients have Kawasaki shock syndrome, and that's where I think the distinction can be the hardest because uh, kids with Kawasaki shock syndrome, if you go back to pre-COVID times, um, have severe GI symptoms, have a very similar constellation of lab tests, although maybe not as extreme. A third have depressed LV function, and 40% have at least mild, have more than mild MR. This is a group at risk for aneurysms. 80% have high troponins. Um, it is easy enough uh, to um, misdiagnose it that if you look at this recent publication uh, um, from FAMDU in uh, Peds ID journal, you see a huge spike in the diagnosis uh, nationally of severe KD uh, just at the time of the Miss C peak. That almost, uh, you know, you could be pretty much uh, virtually certain, I guess, uh, that these patients were miscoded and actually had Miss C. It can be very hard to distinguish. So, how is KD different from Miss C? Well, KD, 80% of KD cases happen in early childhood, and um, most Miss C happens in kids who are school age or adolescent, so about the inverse numbers. GI symptoms are, are generally much more prominent in Miss C. There is a great, greater degree of cytokine storm, and uh, the lab profile has higher D-dimers, higher ferritin, troponins, uh, BNPs uh, or NT pro BNPs, generally much lower platelets and absolute lymphocyte counts. And then Miss C patients are more likely to present in shock and with profoundly lower LV ejection fractions. Uh, but there's still a lot of debate uh, now as to whether Miss C and KD are discrete conditions that have different pathophysiologies, or whether they're really this similar inflammatory conditions that are triggered by different antigens. Uh, very much on our mind now as one of our patients on the ward I'm caring for this week is developing aneurysms. So uh, going back to the CDC, uh, again, the latest data that's posted there would say that there are over 5,500 cases of MIS-C nationally. Of those, uh, 48 have died, so that's a mortality rate less than 1%, 60% male, 99% have tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, and half are between 5 and 13 years of age. 
The other uh, striking feature is the predominance of minority, underrepresented minority patients with more than half of patients being either uh, Hispanic, Latino, or, or black, non-Hispanic. Uh, white patients who are non-Hispanic only constitute 32%. Yeah, that is in relationship to the general population they're dealing with. In the CDC database. Um, so um, I think you were asking, was that uh, Victor? Uh, I think you were asking how that compares uh, to what we see in uh, in COVID incidents. And in fact, uh, that analysis was published in JAMA Open, and it does look like they, there is a higher incidence even adjusting, uh, even if you adjust for uh, the developing COVID, and nobody really knows why. So the first, the first sort of two big descriptions were published in the New England Journal uh, in late June 2020. The first came from the Overcoming COVID study, where 77% of the first 186 cases were treated with IVIG, 21% uh, got a second dose, about half got systemic steroids, 8% uh, had IL-6 inhibitors, 13% uh, then were getting anakinra, about half anticoagulation, 80% were in the ICU, 4% got ECMO, 20% mechanical ventilation, and 48% vasoactive support. And despite these, these numbers that are really pretty impressive, the median hospitalization was seven days, and the mortality in this early series was only 2%. Uh, we know from Dufour, published in the same version of the New England Journal, uh, the same issue uh, with the New York State data, that uh, the symptoms that you have with Ms. C are very uh, related to your age. So uh, KD symptoms, interestingly, are far more common in young patients, uh, and myocarditis becomes increasingly more common uh, as you get older, just as all forms of myocarditis seem to do. Um, Non-cardiovascular involvement uh, includes um, most prominently the GI tract, with more than 90% of patients in all age groups uh, having GI symptoms. Patients also have a high incidence of coagulopathy. DVT and pulmonary emboli are increased, but less common. Uh, they're still quite rare. Uh, mucocutaneous criteria that are Kawasaki-like, we discussed. Respiratory symptoms are actually quite common. Uh, and then less common are musculoskeletal symptoms and neurologic symptoms, which nonetheless can be devastating, even though they're rare. Uh, we're going to concentrate more on the heart uh, during uh, this talk, though. And again, from the earliest overcoming COVID study uh, last June, 80%, uh, as I mentioned, had cardiovascular involvement, 50% had elevated troponin, and ele quite elevated BNP was present in three quarters of patients. Uh, more than a third had an LV ejection fraction less than 55% which for the non-cardiologist would be the definition of, of LV dysfunction. 8% uh, in this series uh, had coronary aneurysms, and as mentioned, 4% on ECMO. So how, how is it uh, in MISC that the heart is involved? We know in general that COVID can be associated with cardiomyocyte invasion, but that uh, it's much more characterized by a dis dysregulated uh, inflammatory response by endothelial injury and hypercoagulability uh, and by microvascular injury. And this translates to ventricular dysfunction, uh, coronary dilation and aneurysms, and then EKG and conduction abnormalities. And we're going to talk a little bit more about each of those. Um, early data uh, this is a figure uh, that reviewed the world's literature that, that came out in circulation in 2020. And what you'll notice uh, in the left-hand panel for LV dysfunction is in those published series, that ranged from 21% to 100%. Uh, and uh, coronary artery dilation and aneurysms ranged from 6% to 24%. 
And those wide ranges probably reflect selection biases in the different series, and also the fact that there really were no standardized measurements. Um, uh, in the Overcoming COVID study, we tried to see what distinguished Ms. C from severe acute COVID. And I should say that Overcoming COVID includes 66 hospitals, 33 states. Patients did not sign informed consent, and all data were de-identified. Uh, so selection bias is a little bit less likely in this setting. Um, and um, here, we, we looked at 539 patients who had missed C versus 577 who had severe COVID-19. Uh, and what was found was that Miss C was distinguished by being in the 6 to 12 year old age group, being non Hispanic black, uh, having severe cardiovascular or mucocutaneous involvement, uh, and also having more severe inflammation. Uh, interestingly, there was no difference in, the, in this graph. Uh, the light colored bars are acute severe COVID, all hospitalized. The dark bars are Miss C also obviously all hospitalized. Uh, and this shows ventilator support that there was really no difference in the proportion of children uh, who had ventilator support. Uh, but this graph shows vasoactive uh, agent or vasopressor support. You can see it's way, way more common uh, in the Miss C patients. Um, if you look uh, at uh, this forest plot, you can see uh, that compared with children who had COVID-19, those with Miss C were much more likely to have cardiorespiratory involvement, cardiovascular without respiratory, uh, mucocutaneous without res and mucocutaneous without respiratory, whereas the uh, COVID, the kids more likely to have just simply acute severe COVID had other problems without respiratory, uh, cardiovascular, or mucocutaneous. The lab values also varied in the first 48 hours, with Miss C patients being more likely to have uh, a high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, very low platelets, and a very high C-reactive protein. Um, this study gave us the opportunity to review the echo reports. So we didn't we did not have a core lab for for the echoes themselves, but we looked at the echo reports uh, which were able to obtain in 503 patients in the series uh, with Miss C. Uh, and what's notable is uh, whether you had an ejection fraction that was severely depressed under 35 percent, or in orange 35 to 45 percent or or in dark green, 45 to 55%, you recovered very rapidly. And just about everybody got back to normal uh, or close to normal systolic function by 40 days after onset. Uh, we know, however, that diastolic dysfunction doesn't seem to recover as quickly. And that probably the best experience is a single center from study from CHOP, um, from Matsubara et al., where they studied 28 children with Miss C, 20 healthy controls, and 20 Kawasaki disease patients. And they found that all Miss C patients, even those with normal uh, systolic function, had diastolic dysfunction. And that the, the, um, those that uh, had elevated troponin had the worst diastolic dysfunction, and that that uh, diastolic dysfunction persisted well beyond the point uh, where systolic function normalized. And there's also been a lot of discussion and debate about the coronary dilation that occurs uh, in some patients with um, with Miss C. Uh, many people had originally hypothesized that this was different from Kawasaki disease, where you have destruction of the actual vascular wall. Rather, maybe these patients just had extreme vasodilation from cytokine storm. But there definitely are cases uh, of children with giant aneurysms, as in this case uh, published from uh, Evelina of London. Uh, and uh, uh, that patient developed the giant aneurysm over time 
Uh, we have one of those cases here as well. Uh, in the Overcoming COVID study, again, only looking at reports in 424 children with reports where the coronaries were mentioned and characterized uh, that there were 13.4% who could be considered to have aneurysms based on the American Heart Association definition. Uh, and of those, about 80% seem to, with relatively sparse long-term data, uh, seem to have returned to a normal dimension. But that, that is an area that requires a lot more study. How about cardiac MRIs? Uh, one of the largest series included 20 patients with a mean time to MRI of 20 days. Uh, and uh, this was Nathia Karas uh, et al. in 2020. Half of the patients had myocardial edema, and only one patient in this series had late gadolinium enhancement. Interestingly, neither strain nor ejection fraction seemed to correlate in this study with persistent edema scarring or the time to presentation, uh, and more larger studies are definitely uh, underway. Arrhythmias and EKG changes are something that we always monitor in MIS-C with 7 to 60 percent of patients with MIS-C affected. Um, we frequently see uh, non, not, sort of diffuse, nonspecific ST and T wave changes and prolonged QT intervals. One can have atrial arrhythmias with atrial ectopy or even atrial fibrillation. Uh, similarly, ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, including non-sustained uh, ventricular tachycardia or VTAC that required resuscitation in ECMO. That's often a reason for crashing onto ECMO. Uh, and then AV block, uh, first, second, and third degree AV block, and a little bit more on that. There are two big studies on AV block or series, and both single center series. Uh, one from Choi et al. at Columbia, where they found a 20% prevalence of first degree AV block. Um, all patients who had a prolonged PR interval in this series were covered without progression, and they did not find uh, any association with severe illness or cardiac involvement. Uh, Audrey Dion at Boston Children's also published our institutional experience, uh, which is a little bit different. And uh, I should state that everybody at Columbia in this era was treated with steroids. And very few of our initial patients got steroids, and we think that that might be one of the reasons for the differences. We saw that 75% of our patients, uh, among the 20% who got first degree block, progressed to second or third degree AV block. These were all the kids that progressed were all very sick with hypotension and shock and ventricular dysfunction. Uh, we found, interestingly, that the conduction system abnormalities seemed to peak during hospitalization and were at their worst at six to eight days after onset of symptoms, sometimes when the patients were actually already getting better. Uh, the high-grade block, though, all resolved uh, within one to six days of reaching its worst, and nobody required resuscitation or medication or pacing you know, in our experience. So how do we manage this C? Um, I, I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time on uh, three series. The first uh, was from Udali uh, and colleagues. It's a small French study uh, looking at IVIG plus steroids versus uh, IVIG alone. And this was that they did a propensity score matched analysis of, of those two therapies. Their primary outcome was fever at 48 hours, uh, and secondary outcome was a need for second-line treatments, hemodynamic support, LV ejection fraction, and PICU stay. And they found, uh, they found that IVIG and steroids led to improved outcomes. So you can see here uh, that um, uh, they, they had not just, I think I lost the top line, hold on a minute, Yes, primary outcome, which was treatment failure, was significantly better with IVIG plus steroids. And uh, the secondary therapy, hold on, was also uh, all of the secondary outcomes were better. They actually shortened their ICU stay by 2.4 days. 
Um, then came the Overcoming COVID-19 study uh, that uh, was published in the New England Journal, which also did a propensity match. So uh, this was a sur surveillance data that included 58 US hospitals uh, and compared the efficacy of IVIG alone plus steroids versus IV, uh, plus IVIG by itself with a propensity score matched analysis and also um, inverse probability treatment weighting analyses. And those were used to, again, to be sure that relatively comparably, comparable patients were getting the treatment. The primary composite outcome here was shock that required vasopressor or LV, uh, vasopressors or LV ejection fraction that was depressed on or after day two of illness. Uh, and here uh, you can see that with the propensity score matching, uh, so IVIG plus glucocorticoids better to your left, IVIG alone better to your right, uh, that there was a lower composite risk score of cardiovascular dysfunction, uh, also uh, that which was the primary outcome of the study. Uh, and uh, that was also true with inverse probability weighted analysis with uh, significantly better uh, outcomes in shock, the adjunctive use of immunomodulatory therapy, and at least in the IPWA analysis, less recurrent uh, fever. Um, in that same issue of the New England Journal uh, came the BATS study, which is Mike Levine's uh, consortium uh, from England, and that is an international observational cohort study uh, of suspected MIS-C. Uh, patients were voluntarily uploaded into a web-based database. 20% uh, of that cohort did not meet WHO criteria, uh, but it was a very real-world experience uh, with 600, uh, 614 children uh, and 32 countries. Their primary outcome was a composite of inotropic support or mechanical ventilation by day two or death. And then they had a severity score that they used. They had secondary outcomes of escalation of treatment and time until reduction in uh, organ failure or inflammation. Uh, they had very different studies. So here, uh, again, IVIG and glucocorticoids are to your left, to the left, and uh, IVIG alone being better to your right. Only treatment escalation was better with combined therapy. Uh, and um, uh, they also had uh, less respiratory. Uh, this was a, I'm sorry, this is a graph, a subgroup analysis of steroids alone on your left versus IVIG alone on your right. And in that analysis, children who got steroids alone had less need for respiratory uh, support after day two and less frequently died. Um, and so what are the differences in these studies? Both very well done studies. Uh, the overcoming COVID participants were adjudicated. They all met the CDC definition and BATS included those 20% of suspected cases that weren't confirmed. Um, the overcoming COVID-19 patients were a whole lot sicker. 47% on vasopressors, 41% with LV dysfunction, 18% with mechanical support, Compared to BATS patients, 12% on vasopressors, 12% over dysfunction, 1.5% on mechanical support. And then they had very different endpoints as well. Uh, so the study, the study designs were different, the patients were different. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to know more with the recovery trial that's going on in Europe now. Just to, to finish uh, with the immunomodulatory treatment that in version three, is just released by the American College of Rheumatology. They are recommending high dose IVIG plus IV methylprednisolone uh, for patients, all patients with MIS-C in the United States, um, that refractory patients, despite IVIG and low dose glucocorticoids, should get pulse steroids for non responders. Uh, if they don't respond to that, they can get uh, high dose anakinra. Uh, and or infliximab uh, for patients that 
um, don't respond to anakinra or contraindications to, to uh, long-term steroids. Really important to know that this is not evidence-based. It's, it's consensus, wisdom, uh, and uh, that's why there have been three versions of these guidelines uh, since the first ones a year ago. Uh, serial lab test and cardiac assessment should guide your immunomodulatory treatment and tapering. And patients do often need to be tapered from those therapies uh, together with your rheumatologist over a two to three week period so that they don't rebound. Uh, just uh, last week, the WHO guidelines came out and they recommended steroids alone for uh, Ms. C with a level of evidence that is uh, said to be very low and it's a conditional recommendation. They say in the guidelines that um, they are recommending this based on a meta-analysis, but there's no reference to that meta-analysis. And so most of us are a little bit baffled, including the people on the US side who participated. So we're hoping to hear a lot more about that. Um, just a very brief word about thromboprophylaxis. Everybody should be on aspirin. Uh, patients, uh, in terms of anticoagulation, there again are wide differences across the country. Uh, the Action Network guidelines uh, that came out earlier this year recommend anticoagulation for anybody with confirmed thrombosis or pre existing uh, 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 indication moderate to severe ventricular dysfunction, giant aneurysms, extremely high D-dimers uh, of greater than 10 times the upper limit of normal. Uh, and then these last two seem particularly less evidence-based, elevation of troponins and EKG changes uh, consistent with myocardial ischemia. Uh, no anticoagulation added to aspirin for patients with normal echoes, low D-dimers, less than five times the upper limit of normal, and no other uh, risk factors for um, thrombotic events. Um, in terms of cardiac testing, we recommend that everybody have an ECG, BNP, troponin, and echo at baseline. Uh, ECGs are performed one, every one to two days during hospitalization because of conduction system abnormalities coming out. One should trend BNP and troponin, repeat the echo as clinically indicated. During outpatient follow-up, uh, echo and ECG are usually performed about one to two weeks after a patient goes home, and then four to six weeks later. Uh, we only repeat BNP and troponin if it hasn't normalized yet. Culture monitors are done for patients who've had conduction system abnormalities. Uh, and then for those with LV dysfunction, uh, one does repeat the echo and ECG within the year uh, as clinically indicated. We treat these children as though they had myocarditis. So exercise restrictions are enforced for at least three months. Uh, and many, many people do MRIs, uh, either in the acute phase at three to four months or both before patients return to sports. Um, for those with aneurysms, it's easy. Uh, one just follows the American Heart Association KD guidelines. Uh, but I will say that coronaries can be really challenging to see in obese teenagers and so there are times that one has to do a CT scan to really get a good image. Uh, return to play is a huge issue in general after COVID, uh, but for patients with Ms. C, we treat them as though they had myocarditis. And if they had depressed function early, then they are restricted for the, that three to six month period with resumption of activities when the ECG, echo, a halter, exercise test, uh, and possibly an MRI are all normal. And that's only for that subgroup with LV dysfunction. Uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions still in this C. Uh, Monique uh, alluded to the Overcoming COVID study, uh, which has now enrolled over 1,000 kids with Ms. C. And that, uh, that study is characterizing long-term outcomes, coronaries, ventricular dysfunction, arrhythmia, and conduction disturbance. Also looking at systemic organ dysfunction, the overall inflammatory response, and how many kids really have major medical events. And we hope with that, that we'll be able to have clinical risk stratification models 
and maybe be able to phenotype for correlation with some of the basic transli translational mechanistic studies that are being done. This is a map of overcoming COVID centers, and you can see across the US. Uh, and this is our latest demographics, again, showing that the mode is really in that five to nine year old age group, predominant male, and a, a lot of underrepresented minority patients. So our challenges now are to figure out the fundamental biologic mechanisms, what are the long-term sequelae, and what are the best clinical pathways uh, for, for evidence-based care. And we still, I have to say, have quite a distance to go. I'm just going to spend the last few minutes on acute myocarditis uh, that follows, that follows uh, vaccination with um, the particularly mRNA vaccines. This uh, was uh, a, a plot that was downloaded from COVIDnet, which if you aren't familiar with it, really is a fantastic resource uh, that the CDC has for, for seeing in real time what's happening to kids. You can see that we're still really quite, uh, there are quite a lot of cases, uh, particularly in children, and the race is between COVID-19 and vaccination and the mutants, uh, the variants that are arising. The CDC case definition is the one that we're using where uh, a probable case of myocarditis uh, involves the presence of at least one new or worsening of these symptoms of chest pain, pressure or discomfort, dyspnea or shortness of breath, palpitations or syncope, and also having at least one new finding uh, of elevated troponin, an abnormal ECG or rhythm monitoring consistent with myocarditis and the particular criteria, abnormal cardiac function or wall motion abnormalities on echo, and uh, particularly important are the cardiac MRI findings consistent uh, with myocarditis, which, which are the Lake Louise criteria plus no other identifiable cause for symptoms or findings. That's a probable case. To be a confirmed case, you have to have those same symptoms together with either histopathologic uh, confirmation or elevated troponin above the upper limit of normal together with meeting Lake Louise criteria by cardiac MRI and having no other identifiable cause. Uh, acute pericarditis uh, can occur particularly um, with vaccine myocarditis, can come together uh, with what we call, so you have what we call myopericarditis, but isolated pericarditis, I would say, is a, a lot less common uh, in COVID-19 uh, COVID, uh, related diseases and miss c um, <laughs> We published an early case series. This is Audrey Dion's work um, of our first 15 cases here at Boston Children's. <laughs> and here, uh, these kids um, presented um, one to five days, uh, largely after vaccination. Uh, boys, much more than girls. Only three patients had elevated, had depressed LV function, but 12 had late gadolinium enhancement. Nobody died. There were no mortalities. Um, and uh, we're following those kids. I can tell you off the record that um, of nine children that have come back, we had 12 with, with LGE to start. Uh, so scarring uh, an injury in the myocardium. And of those nine, Eight still have it, but it is much, much better. Uh, and that's at about three months later. In a much bigger series that Oregon and, and Monique participated in, uh, we have a series that's uh, going to come out in circulation, we think December 6th, uh, that looked at 139 children across the country uh, who had vaccine, presumed vaccine myocarditis. 99% of those presented with chest pain, uh, about 31% with fever, 27% with shortness of breath, 16% uh, with headache, 
and then uh, fewer with myalgias, vomiting, fatigue, or palpitations. Um, we saw very characteristic EKG changes in a lot of these kids. You can see ST segment elevation uh, in the inferior leads and then the lateral leads for the non cardiologists as V3, V4, V5, V6. You can see that the ST segment is high. And uh, some children had non sustained VTAC, which is quite dramatic. Um, of those EKG changes, we did see them in about 70% of children. And of those 70%, 98% had ST segment, uh, non specific ST changes or ST segment elevation. Uh, we saw non sustained VT in 5%, uh, low voltages in 4%. Uh, and then less commonly, PVCs, atrial tachycardia, APCs, and first degree AV block. Important, and this is really important, most children had normal echoes. So your screening echo, your point of care echo in the emergency room just isn't really useful. 81% uh, had normal function, 16% mild dysfunction, and uh, only 1% each had moderate or severe dysfunction, and very few had significant pericardial effusions. Um, of the cardiac MRIs, uh, these were done an average of four days from symptom onset, uh, so, uh, but a range uh, of one to 45 days, uh, but most were within that two to five day range. They had by and large normal LV ejection fractions and RV ejection fractions, so the squeeze of the heart was good. Uh, but 85% had abnormal tissue findings in the myocardium. 97% of those had late gadolinium enhancement, and 60% and had evidence of myocardial edema. Uh, if you use the Brighton classification, 54% met criteria for definite myocarditis, uh, and 46% for probable myocarditis. These are the latest CDC data that Matt Oster presented in November, uh, where you can see um, information on Pfizer uh, in girl and males and in females. Uh, and uh, the areas that are shaded are background, those are reporting rates that exceed what you would expect in the background. Uh, if you concentrate on males uh, receiving dose two, so second dose of, of Pfizer mRNA, you can see that it is these later teenage boys that seem to have the highest prevalence of 69 per, uh, per million second doses administered, much, much lower in girls. Uh, and then it diminishes as you get into young adulthood. We don't have any data really yet on uh, the five to 11 year group. Uh, the CDC did a, a very nice uh, risk benefit analysis uh, and uh, the risks of myocarditis uh, are far outweighed by the benefits, including myocarditis from COVID-19 and other kinds of severe illness. So we are still recommending vaccination for all children. I'm sure you like, like we are being flooded with uh, parent questions about should they get their child vaccinated. Um, I think that uh, I am going to spend one moment because we get a lot of questions on should you be vaccinated after you've had Miss C. We are recommending uh, that although the CDC does not come out with a clear recommendation, and uh, but we are recommending that uh, if um, if there is clinical recovery including normal LV function, more than 90 days since Ms. C diagnosis, if they're at risk for SARS-CoV-2 exposure and transmission because of where they live, and if the onset of Ms. C occurred before COVID-19 vaccination, there are some cases of Ms. C reported to the CDC uh, after vaccination. Uh, and you can also consider it if there's, uh, if you are at just very high personal risk uh, of having severe COVID-19 because of an underlying uh, medical condition. So uh, there are new vaccine myocarditis studies um, on the horizon. Uh, there, um, we are following uh, children here, and I think other centers are as well, 
for the long-term outcomes uh, on MRI. Pfizer has now, as of yesterday, submitted a protocol to the FDA to be done in conjunction with, um, with pediatric heart network centers and those centers that are interested that participated in uh, the circulation study uh, to do long-term follow-up of the patients that had uh, vaccine myocarditis. So that is, we passed the writing protocol phase that is now submitted. Uh, and Moderna is looking into doing a very similar study, although they have very little experience in this country giving the vaccine to children. So I, I'm going to stop so we have a, a few moments for questions. This is a team effort for sure. Uh, and I just wanted to thank my, my colleagues in my home institution, uh, my colleagues um, in the Overcoming COVID study uh, and the music study. Uh, and all the colleagues and patients really around the country who participated in, in so many of uh, uh, the studies that have really helped us understand Ms. C and vaccine myocarditis better. I'm going to stop for questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I know that that was a tremendous gallop through a lot of data. So we have, we have 10 minutes for questions. So thank you so much. That was an incredible gallop through all of those um, pieces of information that are so important to us and answer so many questions that I have and I'm sure others um, have been thinking about. Um, we have a couple of technical questions up front. Uh, Jeremiah Moore, who is one of our sonographers, was wondering about coronary artery 2.5. Is that referring to uh, Z-score? And that was um, in your Z-score, yeah, okay. As thought. There's another question from Melissa. I'm not going to say your last name because I will make a mess of it. Um, but she would like to know what the max IVIG dose in grams that you would recommend giving. Do you stick to two grams per kilo for um, MISC, no matter how much the child weighs? I think this is interesting since we have bigger kids. Yeah. It is a really big problem. First of all, we use two grams per kilo ideal body weight, and we usually max at 100. Max at 100. Good to know. Um, and a lot of these kids are obese. The other thing I should yes. say is because some have poor LV function, you might want to divide uh, your IVIG into two doses of one gram per kilo over per day for two days. Good point. Um, and then uh, Dr. Kathy Holmes, who's one of our cardiologists here, has a couple of questions. Have there been any issues related to the volume load of IVIG? So long. Uh, you know, yes, which is the children get edematous. They have low albumins. It, it's very much like uh, some bad Kawasaki patients. And so that's the reason you might want to um, divide the two grams per kilo over two days in some patients. And you can, you can sandwich it with Lasix if you need to. And then also from Dr. Holmes, based on the experience and current data, are we clinging to IVIG based on our, our historical comfort level as opposed to true efficacy? Um, I think we're, uh, well, first of all, this is a moving target. I would preface it to say that what we don't know, we don't know what IVIG alone does. Actually, there's very, very little data, but there's a trial going on called the recovery trial. And so maybe we'll know. Uh, IVIG, um, two out of three very well done propensity match score studies in U.S. patients, well, one in U.S. patients, one in France, showed pretty unequivocal data that IVIG plus steroids are better. Um, there are data, uh, Dr. Croker had a JCI paper that came out a couple of months ago looking at neutrophils, which are very bad actors in this disease, uh, showing that IVIG actually kills neutrophils that are express IL-1 beta. Uh, and those investigators from San Diego have proposed that maybe that's how IVIG works in this disease and Kawasaki's. It does the same in both. But I, I'm going to stay, I think for now, the best data in an, in an area that's not resource constrained. So in this country, unlike uh, certain third world countries, we can get IVIG. The risks are really tiny. 
Uh, and uh, there is enough data to suggest that it's more effective, that that is what we do for our patients. Um, we might change our mind based on new data that comes in a month from now, but it's the best data that we have. Okay, thank you. I, uh, Dr. Abology, who's also one of our uh, cardiologists, uh, has a, a question that vaccine, should they avoid more doses of the same vaccine? I think the question about boosters is really out there for kids who've had a vaccine associated yeah. myocarditis. I, I think there's n nobody is brave enough to test that uh, to see what happens, at least at present. I think that if you think if this is a classic case of uh, myocarditis, you wouldn't do it. Uh, Juan Carlos Meniz uh, in Florida has one child that had mild myocarditis after uh, the first dose uh, and got a second dose and had rip-roaring myocarditis. I think I, I, I would stay away from it unless we have data to suggest that there's something we can do to make it safer. Um, there's another question from Dr. Gilhooley. Um, uh, do we see any cardiac effects in children that are similar to those seen in adults with long COVID, such as hypertension, tachycardia, irregular heartbeats? Um, I think this is for MISC. So we do, we do see patients. Um, first of all, MISC is considered a form of long COVID. Uh, because the symptoms last longer than 30 days after Miss C. Uh, so some people, there's a big grant called Recover, not to be confused with recovery, that is now studying this, and Miss C is included. Um, my impression, and this is mostly, I mean, we're going to have a lot more data, probably the best data from the music study relatively soon, but my impression is that we're not seeing. Uh, a ton of uh, dizziness or POTS or chest pain beyond about six weeks. Uh, most of the kids do seem, uh, that's just my impression, will have real data to follow. Uh, I think it will be quite rare to have very, very long lasting symptoms. Uh, there's another question regarding MRI. So in children who have had, uh, or we see many patients with chest pain or shortness of breath, et cetera, after a vaccine, they typically have a normal echo, normal troponin, normal CRP. Who should have an MRI? Um, yeah, I think if you have a normal troponin, I wouldn't get, I, I personally wouldn't get an MRI. There's a ton of inflammation that if you, if you look at the radiology literature, I, uh, um, the entire sort of lymph node tree all the way down uh, into the axilla uh, is often enlarged after vaccination on that side of the chest. Uh, it used to be thought that supraclavicular nodes, for example, were a pathognomonic of, of uh, cancer in children, and we're seeing them all the time now after vaccination. So, I mean, this is a highly immunogenic vaccine, and uh, if there's no elevation in troponin, I, I would attribute the chest pain, which we do see a lot of, to more chest wall and sort of other inflammatory uh, features of the vaccine. Okay, I have a question. I'm having to uh, filter some of these questions here because there are quite a few at the end, but I will ask them to Dr. Neuberger at our other sessions if I can't get them in now and get back to you. Um, but a uh, question from one of our neonatologists, Dr. Duchovny. Um, who is thanking you very much for your talk. Uh, there are case reports in the literature re um, talking about MISC or MIS neonatal, MISN, and even MISF fetal. Can you comment about cardiac manifestations that may occur in vertical perinatal transmission? Yeah, I, I have to say I don't know as much about that. We have, I think it's very hard to distinguish those from, from acute COVID. Uh, and I, I'm going to not answer that question because I don't think I can answer it intelligently. We have seen cases of poor LV function uh, in after a child is born in a mother with COVID, but I don't know if that's Miss C or COVID or what it is. I, there may be people that are a lot smarter about that than I am. Okay, I think maybe we have time for one more question here. Um, 
So there was a question from uh, Dr. Sarah Green, who is one of our um, pediatricians and uh, hospitalists and would, is wondering about uh, the version of the room rheumatic, rheumatology guidelines. Um, uh, what would you recommend, would you recommend, uh, sorry, would you recommend this version of the room guidelines and how much time do you allow before one treatment has failed before you move to the next level? Yeah, I think it. I think we move pretty quickly from one to the other if a child is continuing to be very, very sick. Um, I think these guidelines are a consensus document, and I understand from people who are there that, you know, they they really did have to be hashed out, and that there were a lot of differing opinions. Uh, we think we use them here. Uh, we think that they're kind of the best judgment at the moment, but they are going to have to be revised almost constantly as new information comes in. There are places, at, there are things that you have to consider about individual patients. Depending on the ability of a patient to comply, if you use high dose steroids, you have to taper those steroids very carefully. Uh, and I know that at some hospitals where they have very indigent populations that are unable to, to comply carefully with instructions, uh, they've used infliximab with good results. So those centers include um, uh, Detroit Children's Hospital and Denver. Uh, and, and so there are probably many different ways you can do this, but a good starting place uh, are the ACR guidelines, adjusting for patient particulars of individual patients. All right, I think we should probably stop there. We're at time now, um, unless there's anyone else who desperately needs something to be heard. It looks like a lot of questions flashed up. So I'm, I'm, I think on my last slide, I had there, if you can email if you have questions or Monique can tell me them later. Right. Perfect, thank you so much. So I just wanted to let everyone know that Dr. Newberger is um, talking again this afternoon at one o'clock. Um, uh, on neurodevelopmental outcomes. The title of her talk is Beyond Mortality, Neurodevelopmental Outcomes in Congenital Heart Disease. Um, that's also going to be um, a remote talk. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Neuberger. This is an amazing grand rounds and we're looking forward to this afternoon.